Good evening, citizens of Portsmouth. I call to order our public work session. And Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Barnes? Present. Mr. Battle? Mrs. Lucas Burke? Here. Mr. Moody? Here. Dr. Whitaker? Present. Mr. Woodard? Here. Mayor Glover? Here. Thank you, ma'am. Madam Clerk? Oh, excuse me. Madam City Manager? Ma'am, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, the first presenter tonight will be Deputy City Manager Bob Baldwin uh, with the CDBG uh, review. This presentation is to try to address concerns um, that were raised and to talk about uh, the next steps forward. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Glover, Vice Mayor Barnes, members of City Council, and as the city manager just stated um, uh, the intent with this pr uh, presentation this evening is to try to follow up on um, a few of the issues and questions that came up at the um, uh, last council meeting when we had the uh, more in-depth discussion on the full CDBG and home program budgets. Um, just quick overview. Um, as you're aware, we're working on the budget. It's the annual uh, action plan as part of the city's uh, five-year consolidated, consolidated plan. That's a plan that we have... Uh, City Council's adopted and has been um, reviewed and approved by HUD. Uh, trying to stay on schedule in terms of getting the um, CDBG and home program funds uh, back to the city's hands to use them. We typically target May the 15th as the um, date we like to have the uh, budget submitted to HUD. They have a 45 day review period once we submit the City Council adopted uh, budget to them. And that puts us in line to get the uh, CDBG and home program funds eligible for release to us uh, by July 1st. So we try to get those as close as we can to the beginning of the fiscal year. Um, just one other thing, and this is, I don't think an issue has not happened before, just as a, just as a point of information, um, because of the way HUD operates, if you um, were to, to, for whatever reason, decide not to approve this uh, budget uh, now, wanted to do some additional work on it, uh, you must have your annual action plan submitted to HUD by August the 16th. After that, they will not accept it and you'll lose out on your, on your funding. So that is what I would call the, um, CDBG home program drop dead dates for submission to HUD, which will be August the 16th. So what I want to cover um, tonight really is those issues were raised by city council regarding some of the service providers we use that are located outside of the city's um, boundaries. And so there's, there's three of those uh, in particular that were raised. So we'll start with the first one, which is the, the uh, housing crisis hotline, which is provided um, services provided by four kids. Um, as you can see, that's a $54,167 item in the CDBG uh, budget. Um, and I think there's some confusion as to whether or not we contracted with someone independently outside of the city. And just to make clear, we're part of a uh, regional uh, coalition that actually um, supports um, four kids in the separate. There are 13 communities in Hampton Roads that actually have this service provided by um, for kids and it's basically like a, like a call center almost enough uh, staff there to make sure that it's always staffed. So you can see on the slide here the number of localities from Hampton Roads that are also providing support to the four kids to provide this exact same service. Um, as was noted the last time, um, we've had uh, uh, been funding this program with four kids for the past three years. We've had over 6,000 households have received service through four kids for that period of time. And we just note um, the question regarding whether there should be someone locally to provide the service. There's no one locally that could, you know, in a short period of time, be able to take on this kind of a service. So if the city uh, council is interested in trying to take this on unilaterally instead of participating as part of this larger group, it would take some time to, to um, determine how to actually perform that function and staff it um, and come up with a budget for operating it. In this case, obviously, we're one of 13 localities providing funding for the overall budget of the operation. So that's that four kids piece. Uh, the second one was the um, independent center. Um, there's our independent living services for um, providing uh, a service for the disabled. It's a $44,000 item. Once again, we're, we're part of a larger group of Hampton Roads localities that supports the independent center for this. There's seven communities Again, the ones that, are, that support them are listed up there. Um, over the last five years, we've had 383 um, citizens that have pro been provided services through the Independent Center through this program. And once again, there's no 
uh, independent organization operating within the city that provides the same level and type of, of service at the at the present time. So again, if if the uh, desire was to try to provide this uh, totally operated locally with a local provider, that would have to be something you'd have to explore whether or not you could actually you know, develop an organization um, to carry out that service. As it is, uh, these seven communities are all going in together to support this uh, nonprofit. The third one um, it was not in the CDBG program, it was actually the home program. There was a question about the uh, down payment closing cost services. That's a $200,000 budget item out of the home program budget. Just point out this service is, is provided through the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission. And once again, uh, we're not uh, the sole participant in that, in that program with um, HRPDC. Again, you have a number of Hampton Roads localities that use the HRPDC to provide this service. Uh, we have regular contact with the uh, uh, HRPDC over this. And I think one thing to just point out, they don't do um, and have not done uh, uh, meetings in their office with clients. Um, just like almost all real estate transactions today, their services are provided over the phone, uh, online, through other means. They don't do um, uh, in-office uh, meetings to provide this service. As we noted before, they provide down payment closing cost assistance up to $20,000. Um, since 2016, since we've been funding HRPDC for this service, 73 households have participated um, in the program. There, there are currently a number of households working through the program with them at the present time. And again, if the city uh, council wanted to uh, take this on as a local program, this is one that has probably more potential um, for being done locally. Uh, but we uh, don't have anyone on staff uh, ready to sort of pick it up. Uh, uh, and just roll with it um, immediately. So if that was a, an, an interest in moving away from the HRPDC to having the city staff uh, take over the program or have some other provider other than HRPDC do it, that would just take some time to um, kind of figure out how to do that and what that ultimate cost would be for that service. So last couple of items I wanted to get to during the um, last council meeting, some question about how people were, were, were made aware of uh, potential for participating in the CDBG program, other, other nonprofits, other qualifying entities that might want to participate. Uh, what we're proposing is that uh, moving forward into next year's budget, obviously, as I indicate on that first slide with our schedule, is pretty um, tight on us right now. But moving forward, we can certainly move to a much more broad um, uh, program and trying to make more users, more nonprofit groups, and other potentially eligible. Um, uh, people aware of the opportunity to participate in the program so we could, you know, uh, uh, have a few more um, uh, qualifying, uh, qualified uh, uh, nonprofits to participate in the program, or at least submit applications for, for consideration in the process. Um, and we do propose uh, to come back to uh, the City Council in January, and something we haven't been doing in the past, to come back and give you sort of up program updates, how the CDBG and home programs are doing, and come back on uh, looking at these three items I just presented tonight and give you an update on what the um, um, what we've discovered as far as taking over the services uh, locally or not. And with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have um, regarding those items. Councilwoman Lucas Burke, ma'am, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Baldwin, uh, for the presentation. One of the things that, that seem to be in common is um, these other localities that are receiving part of the proposed budget for CDBG, uh, the home service, and also uh, the CDBG service, uh, Picos and Isle of Wight. Right. So we get the funding uh, and they help contribute to the funding, but some of the service goes to those communities? Well, as what happens, all those communities actually fund the program through the provider. Okay. So each locality has a, an agreement with the provider and mm -hmm. provides their level of funding so that the provider has a larger pool of, of funds to work from. Okay. Right. And it's out in, in Portsmouth um, gets a, a piece of that same funding. Is, is it correct. equitable yes. or is it just, yeah. okay. And so, yeah, so it's everybody's sort of putting in their, their piece. And what's good about that, obviously, is that we try to make sure, because they have more staff, we have, since you have more localities participating, you have much less of, a, of an opportunity for someone to, you had a one person or two person operation, someone to call in sick or be on vacation to lose your ability to provide service if you're, if you're small staff. And right. when they operate these with a larger group, then there's um, 
the goal is to try to make sure the help is available for whoever calls over there um, at all at all times that they're in uh, office hours for that. Okay. Councilman Woodard, sir, you have the floor, and then Dr. Whitaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, appreciate your presentation, Mr. Bowman. Baldwin. Um, yeah, yeah, my question is um, pertaining to the home services again. You know, I appreciate your transparency. Like you said, it is something that um, you think that we could take on. Um, what department will actually be taking on this home services and, and probably help us uh, move this 200,000, uh, I guess, back in home? Right. And that would be part of that assessment we'd be doing because you have a couple of different op options. Number one, the city could take it on itself. We'd have to look with the city manager, obviously, at staff, and we're not staffed to take on you know, that full-time role. Uh, you might have potential for using uh, PRHA. might be another agency. We have not discussed them taking you know, the program over. But they might be another, another option that we know right off the top of our head might be uh, potential um, providers of the same type of service. And how long have we been funding this particular service? Um, I think that was been going to PRHA. I think I said that was maybe um, five or six years, I believe. And this is nothing, no one else, other since, councils um, looked into? Since 2016. 2016, no other councils, no, in fact, no the, one. The original, back when you went to 2016, there was an understanding that was a good way to have the service provided. You may not recall, there were, there were a number more um, services that when we had larger CDBG funds and mm -hmm. home funds. PRHA used to provide a lot more services. And when, as PRHA started, uh, watching their costs and reducing the programs that they were they were providing, we had to look for alternative service providers. Right. So, so is this something that's that been six years ago? So it's worth going back and taking a fresh right. look at. So is this something that we are going to start exploring, um, trying to figure out how to do this service? Yes, um, that's what we were proposing that we would come back to City Council in January and let you know what we had found out okay. as far as that goes. All right. Thank you, Dr. Whitaker. You have the floor, yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, uh, Mr. Baldwin, to make sure I'm clear, so are you saying that this um, on the home service, the down payment, closing cost assistance has only uh, been around since the fall of 2016? That's how long HRPDC has been providing the service. So when you said that's how long HRPDC has been providing the service, right. how long has Portsmouth been involved through community, through the home services in providing this closing? Maybe Jeff Cromer may know how long we've been doing that. Good evening. Um, so PRHA provided the service for, I think, in the range of like five years or so. Largely when they were developing Westbury and selling units out there, they did it. Um, and so I think it started around 04, and, and then they discontinued doing it just a few years before we started working with uh, PDC. So, so prior to even that Westbury project, the city of Portsmouth was not involved in providing housing and uh, closing assistance to low-income persons? So I wasn't here at that point, okay. but, but the best that I can tell from the records, they did not start offering it when the so the home program started in the early 90s and it doesn't look like the city started doing down and closing until sometime in the 2000s as i said right around when uh, prha was developing the for sale units in westbury right so so when prha discontinued it um, that assistance was being provided in portsmouth there were a few years where we were not doing down and closing. So, so, so when PRHA was, pro, you, you were saying this program was originally under PRHA, that, that was a down payment and closing assistance program? Correct. So that was located here in Portsmouth? Yes, they used, uh, they had some staff that did it out of their office. Okay, and that was part of the city or PRHA? We put them under agreement the same way we do with the PDC. We put, use them as a sub-recipient, put them under agreement, and they provide the service. Where was that housed? When, at their office. So when they were over here, and then when they moved over to South Street, they okay. moved it with them. Okay. And so now, so, so we have had the service in the city. Correct. And we have had the skill and resources to provide it in the city. 
And so when it shifted over to HR, PDC, um, who were we paying rent to at that time or, or are paying rent to now? We don't pay rent. We, you know, we, so the PDC, again, we have them under agreement right. and we, we pay them a fee the right. same way we paid PRHA a fee. We pay the PDC a fee to deliver the service to cover their overhead the same way that we PD, uh, the PRHA did. Right, and how much? About how much is that overhead? It's uh, around oh, four to five thousand dollars per unit. We um, have a fee schedule with them, and it's based upon them actually closing, you know, a sale, and so it's in that range of four to five. Four to five thousand per unit, depending on their actual costs. You mean per per house that is closed on? Correct. So to, and so, in this process, what what is the um, amount that people can get up to for closing and down payment assistance? They can get up to twenty. Most of them are getting up to fourteen five. They can get up to twenty under uh, some uh, very certain uh, specific conditions. Okay, and these persons may not necessarily be Portsmouth residents, it's just that they're buying a house in Portsmouth. Correct. Okay, and so um, you think it would be beneficial for Portsmouth people to know that the service exists and they can go to an office in Portsmouth and get it? I don't think it's been a detriment. You said, you said what? I don't think it's been a detriment to the program so, that, so, that it's not here. Right, so how many of these new home buyers were actually Portsmouth people? I couldn't tell you, but I, I'm, I'm almost certain 90% or more, probably 95%. Very few are people outside of Portsmouth. It's usually, it, you know, the PDC is working in these other communities, and sometimes they'll have a, a buyer in another com who's looking in another community and cannot afford that community, and the PDC will say, oh, we also have this program in Portsmouth. You may want to look there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, my, like I said last time, my concern is still that we're over in Chesapeake servicing Portsmouth people. And since the program was in Portsmouth, I know one of the justifications has been about finding people who are, have the skills to do it. Evidently, the skills were here before, and so I don't see how they disappeared somehow. Um, the, the next issue uh, is on the follow-up, page uh, six. And um, Mr. Baldwin, you, you were saying that you talk about the next fiscal year. You, you, you're talking about this budget season that's Gary come in or the budget right, I, two was, years from now? Right, what I saw, no, I saw the one we would be doing for next year's budget. Okay. For next year's budget. So we would start that this fall. Yeah. We would actually start the outreach in the fall. The way that process works, we start, you know, working on the next budget as soon as we get into the fall season so that as a city manager and the budget team starts putting the regular city budget together, this can line up. So right. we that's start what, that's, that program in the fall. That's what I mean. So you're saying that you all will start putting in place things in the next budget. Yes. For what we're suggesting for those, for that that um, provision to start re soliciting or making you know a broader advertisement of potential for participation right. that'd be for next for the next cycle right so we're talking two years you, you're talking you, you would be putting it in place for not this year's budget but for the It'd following for, budget. for july of 23. right right so i don't see how it becomes a big budget issue as far as rearranging and adjusting how we're marketing and reaching out what what does it take two years to well it doesn't take two years well they have to, we have a process to go through for applicants to get into the process they have to qualify you know we have you know those are qualifying nonprofits primarily that are uh, become recipients of um, these well, funds well i'm speaking to the marketing of it how people even know about oh, right. that this is available yeah, that I mean, shouldn't take two years no to we would start that's what i was saying we would start doing that for the in the fall for the next budget cycle, which you would be looking at, you know, in the uh, okay. um, right at you know January, February, we would have started reaching out earlier than that. So we were we'd be putting that program together now. So you know, your budget this year would go into effect in July. We'd be talking about once we get into 
you know, the uh, September, October time frame, we'd be reaching out for the next budget cycle. Yeah. And, and I'm, so you haven't come up like with a plan yet exactly how you're going to change that from what you're doing now? No, okay. no. But I don't think that'd be that difficult for us to, to put together a program for doing more outreach. Lucas Burke, Thank Amy, you have the floor. Uh, I guess just kind of rearranging the question that I asked before. So the proposed budget of the 200000 is that split across the um, localities that are listed no. here, or does everybody get Well, the 200000 you run the home program? Yes. Fund? That's our 200000 that's okay. used for providing housing in Portsmouth. Okay. So that's is our, it expended? We're finding that we're doing 20 homes a year? They've pretty much been doing exactly. That's pretty much been their... their um, um, volume they've been able to get people through. It's been a very challenging housing market, as you can imagine. A lot, one of the things that's been happening, these programs have requirements, for example, people getting home inspections done. Right. But in the last year, a lot of sellers have been getting buyers who will skip the home inspection process. And so one of the problems we've been having, and that has nothing to do with who's providing the service, is just the way the market has been. Now, if the interest rate's going up, that's likely to change. But it's been so competitive out there that people are trying to go through the regular process of qualifying for down payment closing cost assistance being outrun by people who have cash, okay. if, that, if that makes sense. Yes, you know? and the $4,000 uh, fee that's given back to HRPDC that's part that of, comes out of it too? That comes out of that 200000 okay. so okay. exactly. That's our total contribution to, to the HRPDC is the 200000 Okay. And, and Mr. Bowen, I have a question. The 1.5, I think it was discussed that our allocation this year would be about $1.5 million from Probably, HUD. Yes. Is that total 1.5 million, whether it's allocated as a collaboration through other organizations in which we use their services to provide the programs that you just spoke about, is that, is that 1.5 allocated and used for our folks in the city of Portsmouth? Yes, sir. Thank exactly. you. Dr. Whitaker, yeah, so you have the, the floor. Um, just follow up. When you said the service provided by uh, online and by phone, um, has that always been how that has yes. been handled? Yes. So well, when I can't go back again, we go back to when HRPDC was doing it, a lot of real estate sales. That's been you know eight or nine years ago. So probably not as much being done the way home sales are being done today. So, but since HRPDC has been doing the program, um, they've been doing it as a online on phone. Um, type of a service without having, you know, um, meetings in their office space. So when PRHA was doing it, it was uh, online and by phone? Uh, I couldn't, I could not tell exactly how PRHA operated back then. I'm guessing in those days, again, I'm going back 10 years ago, real estate market did, did more in person than they do today. So, does, does Mr. Kramer know if it was done in person or online back when PRHA was doing it? My, my belief, you know, I, you know, I knew the re they worked with a realtor uh, largely who was handling the, the Westbury sales. A lot of it was people, he had an office at Westbury, people were going there, but a lot of it was handled over the phone. Mm -hmm. um, the, the lenders, the realtors that people are working with, if, if there's problems with getting information, those lenders and those realtors who are counting on being paid out of this, out of their commissions, are willing to do whatever it takes. And so there's really no need. There has not been any need. And, and I think PRJ was largely running it that way, too. There were not people coming into PRJ's office to, to, to work with them on the down and closing. So, so the, realtors, the realtors were the ones initiating um, this use of this service or having information the, the, about the way the service works you have to be pre-qualified through a lender through an approved lender and then you uh, go in and you apply for the program and show your pre-qualifications and then the people go out and choose a, a realtor and to work with and so they are largely that realtor a lot of the time is, is handling a lot of that paperwork so that so that whoever the lender is is the one that's really initiating this process. Well, the the home buyer is. I mean, the home buyer has to apply to the PDC. They have to show that they're pre-qualified and what their amount of pre-qualification is. Who's for. the PDC? 
the Hampton Roads. Oh, land HRPD. Use. Okay, yes. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, so they, you know, the home buyer is applying for the program, but the, the, they need to be pre qualified through a lender. And, right. And so once they are done with that, they work with the realtor and they work with their lender. And a lot of that communication and paperwork, once they get into the buying of the house, is handled between the PDC and the realtor and the lender. Okay. So once again, that that home buyer would have to have knowledge of this HRPDC program. Yes. Right. Okay. Madam City Manager. The next uh, presentation will be Budget Officer Trey Burke, and he will discuss the revised CIP based on the changes made at the last meeting. Good evening, Ma Good evening Mayor Glover. Uh, Vice Mayor Barnes and members of City Council. Tonight I will briefly review the, two, the fiscal year 2023 through 2027 capital program and any particular changes made to the program after discussions on April 26, both on an overall basis and by category. The Capital Improvement Program, also known as the CIP, is a five-year plan that addresses the procurement and construction of capital assets, as well as ongoing maintenance of city infrastructure through replenishment and replacement projects. The CIP's first year is the only appropriated year. Subsequent years provide a plan for addressing future infrastructure needs with projected expenditures and resources. Capital projects may take more than one fiscal year, and as such, the funding is authorized by a project and the project is closed on completion. Governments utilize capital improvement plans to identify present and future needs requiring capital infrastructure. This chart reflects the reallocation and increase of the overall capital program. The education category was increased by $7.2 million. The community and economic development category was decreased by $516,000. And overall, the capital program was increased by $6.7 million. The various school, and school improvements project includes a Churchland Academy roof replacement and a Craddock Elementary School roof replacement. Both those projects total $2.6 million. After adding the IC Norcom field improvements, the Manor High School field improvements, and the Churchland High Fieldhouse and Lighting projects, the total for education projects is $9.8 million. After removing the Crawford Street roundabout, the community and economic development CIP totals $250,000. This includes the city gateways, demolition, and resiliency planning projects. This presentation discussed the capital program and changes made after direction from council. I'll be glad to answer any questions or report backs you may have. Dr. Whitaker, sir, you have the floor. Uh, yes, Mr. Burke. <clears throat> At our last meeting, the you have under the uh, proposed budget adjustments on page three. I just want to make sure. I know we did the Crawford Street roundabout. Yes, sir. What about the million dollars that we talked about with the evaluation for vehicle services? Was that part of the CIP? That was the placeholder. Right. And that was kind of originally put in that 2.6, which was 3.6. So it just kind of increased it by that amount. So the $1 million is kind of already in that $7.2 million. The, you talking about, which, where are you, which line are you speaking of? Um, the education line. We talked about it being kind of a placeholder. Right. And that money was in the education CIP whenever the budget was originally proposed. Right. And then it was moved down at the manager and um, the engineering's discussion. And it was then decided at the last meeting to, to reallocate that $1 million. So it ends up kind of netting out. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not following you on this here. The seven, the seven point uh, two million adjustment you're saying that that includes the million? Yes, sir. Okay. And also, also these can be adjusted based on the outcome of the infrastructure 
bill as far as any monies that may be coming from that that it could change these figures we would need to come back to council but yes sir. right and the other on page four on the education you have <clears throat> you have the churchland high school field house and lighting and at the last meeting uh, I, re I requested that we move the Churchland High School field improvements, I see Norcom field improvements, and Minor High School field improvements. And then the city manager added in the um, Churchland soccer field lighting. Yes. Is, so that's what that is, is that up here? That's it. That's, it's one project. We, we made it the field house and the lighting one project because it's, it's spatially encapsulated. Well, well, on the handout that you gave us, um, the Church and High School field improvement was uh, separate. And then the city manager added in the uh, Churchland soccer field lighting. Yes. So they're, they're two separate projects. Correct. Because they're not even on the same property. Okay, it was the my soccer, understanding that they are. Let me, unless I'm looking at the, not the soccer field by the middle school. Right. That's it, different. It's you, the you, lighting. And we it's two separate projects, but we combine them because it's still church okay. in that area. Okay. But they're the two separate projects. Okay. And so when when you added on the Churchland uh, soccer field lighting, um, there was some idea of where those funds would possibly come from. Correct. Okay. Okay. Because because um, I'm glad to hear that because it was added on with the field improvements and questions have come up about where the funds would come from. So, And that's the next phase is to come back and talk about proposed. Right, funds. right. So when, but when you tacked it on to the high school, I'm quite sure you did that within mind knowing that there are some sources of funds. Correct. Okay, all right. And so these are both of those projects. Yes. All right. And, and also keep in mind that these projects are still on the list for consideration for ARPA funds as well. Okay. Okay. Vice Mayor Barnes, you have the floor, sir. I have two questions. So um, where does the, um, the, the Charles Pete um, project where is that at? Is that in the ARPA funds? Correct. That's on the list for consideration for ARPA funds. Okay. Um, and what does the, for the, the IC Northern Field Improvements, what does that include? And also for Manor and Churchland, um, is that, that's just for a field house? Correct. And I think uh, City... Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of City Council. Um, to answer your question, Vice Mayor, um, the IC Norcom is uh, the complete complex, and based on um, the presentation tonight, um, it's the field houses at the other two high schools. The lights not that. So, say it again, Mr. Wright. Can you say that again? I, I didn't catch it. Yeah, no, IC Norcom is the entire complex. And for the other two high schools, it's just the field houses. Um, the lighting is not at the high school. It's for the soccer complex. It's, it's in Churchland, but not at the high school. Right, right. So that, that high school, the, the lighting for the soccer field, that's not associated with the high school. Correct. In the, uh, sorry. No, go right on. No, in the overall uh, plans that you saw for the entire suite of improvements for all the fields, they do, each one of them does have... Um, a number of upgrades um, at Churchland. There are lighting, uh, turf field, field house, and some other amenities. Uh, manor, field house, um, some road improvements, um, access road. Uh, the lights were, were already done out there. Uh, turf field. Um, for IC Norcom, it's the entire complex because um, that's one where you can't actually do a, a piece without impacting all the other pieces that needs to be done in its, in its entirety. So so the the upgrades that are in this CIP for the high school improvement, you're saying that's only at the at the schools other than Norcom is only the field house? At the at the cost that was shown, that is only the field houses. So 
so where is the um, turf, for example, for turf, where's the turf field figure for that? So the, the overall figures that were presented, so um, the, the entire upgrades for each one of the complexes, you're, each one is upwards of $5 million. Okay, okay, so the 819 for Churchland, 819,000 for Churchland, 837 for Minor, that's on, those are only field houses? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Madam City Manager, you have yes. the floor. I just wanted to add on a little bit of that. First, uh, in hearing that, uh, we will definitely separate the two projects because that was my mistake. I, don't, I didn't, church, I hear Churchland, I think it's all the same. So the Churchland light is for the soccer field not the school. And so those will be two separate projects. The other piece of that is when we initially started this conversation, uh, it was about the turf field at IC Norcom plus the three field houses. In order to move forward, we had to get a complete understanding of what was on site so that if we went in to do any construction, we wanted to make sure that we didn't interrupt something else. And so with IC Norcom, that's what you were seeing. It was, um, and we thought that it would be a phased approach. Uh, once IC Norcom was done, then we would look to the others to see if that's something that we wanted to move forward with. But initially it was just about a turf field at IC Norcom and three field houses. So when we, um when we talk about the ARPA funds being used, so where will the ARPA funds be allocated according to these projects? The same. It would be for the IC Norcom project as well as the field houses okay. for both uh, the other high schools. So, so are we looking, so for this 9.7 million, we're looking to use ARPA funds to cover all of these costs? It wouldn't be the 9.7 because 2.6 of that uh, is roofing, and that would not be a, a part of that. Okay. Um, so we would only be looking at the field improvements. And the reason why we were looking at ARPA funds is because of the uh, funds that the schools received as a part of their ARPA funds did not cover uh, the recreation facilities. So we were hoping that we could leverage the funds that they were getting for those maintenance HVAC related things um, to use that to offset uh, with the ARPA funds that we use for the recreation facilities. Okay, so when will we have a handle on whether we're using ARPA funds or going out for bonds? When, when will we have that information? That's a good question and it's a moving target unfortunately because we've submitted almost $200 million worth of grant requests uh, for different projects and until we get some indication and we do not know how long that process of review is going to take in addition um, to some, uh, preparing those 200 million dollars worth of requests we put it through to our legislators um, and we've gotten letters of support from some of our partners to try to uh, enhance our ability to get those funds but right now, that timetable is unknown because we don't know when that's going to conclude. Now, the $200 million you're talking about, are you talking ARPA or infrastructure? Infrastructure. Okay, yeah. What's I was asking about ARPA. Oh, ARPA, we, right. get the, we get the next allotment in July. Right. And so we would start having conversations probably early June to talk about where the council wants to go with those funds. So right. we will have a clear understanding of where we're going with those ARPA funds. So the ARPA funds could potentially apply to these projects? Correct. As well as possible infrastructure money? Correct. Right. Although so, we haven't really seen anything from the infrastructure that relates to uh, recreational facilities, but that doesn't preclude us from putting it out there because we were directed by our legislators to put every request out there as long as we justified it and, and I think we've done a really good job of trying to do that. So when will we have again the definite figures of how much will be of ARPA will we be using for these projects? We will have a definite figure of how much we're using for these projects once council we once we have the discussion with council and get policy direction on how you want to use those funds and that will be in June. Well that's sort of that's sort of circular because if, if you already have in mind the 
ARPA funds that are available to use for these projects, then I thought that there would be some presentation to council, here are the ARPA funds, here's what we can apply to these projects, and then here's what we may have to go out to bond and finance. And But again, keep in mind that the ARPA funds are not just for projects. You could determine that you want to do more direct pays, you may determine that you want to do other things. Right. So keep right. in mind, this is just authorization. Right. This is not the funding piece. So when we have the funding discussion, that's when that will come into play. We will present options for how to move forward with these projects. One being ARPA as a potential funding source. Another, I mean, there are other things also on the ARPA list that are not reflected here as well. And so that will be the discussion that we have next. Okay. Well then, well then, if it's, if it's that open, then why aren't we including the high schools, uh, the, the fields at the other high schools, uh, as far as the possible projects that we could be doing if, if you're looking at these different sources of funding that we know the ARPA is coming and possible infrastructure, and we know we have funds available through going out for um, the possible bonds. Yes. In all the discussions we've had, we presented the total um, picture in terms of what the expected costs were in all the fields, but the priorities that we've received have been IC Norcom and the field houses. And now keep in mind also part of that is because we talk about Charles P. We have a number, we have, I want to say $10 million of recreation facility projects that we have programmed currently for ARPA funds. Yeah, I, I may have missed it, but I don't, I don't remember <laughs> prioritizing it in that way that this Norcom's Field House and Turf Field and Churchland, just the lights. I, I don't, I, unless I miss, I don't remember council. Yeah, that, that was actually the discussion. Um, that was part of the one of the earlier discussions um, that came about. Um, do, not this budget, but the budget prior, where we set um, an expectation that we wanted to move forward with the IC Norcom, and it was the IC Norcom turf. Uh, field yeah. and field house plus the other two field houses. It was never the entire complex. The way that the entire complex came into play was be before we went to do construction on the turf field, we had to have an understanding of the impact that it was going to have on the other facilities there. And in doing that, that's how we determined that we couldn't do just the field because it was going to impact all those other areas. And so in order to be able to do the field, you had to budget for the entire complex. That's the only reason why that became a priority because the priority was driven from the turf field. Right. I, I remember the turf field mm -hmm. and the field house. I just, like I said, I don't remember that excluding Churchland um, and um, Manor fields uh, and it just pertaining to the lights. That's that's what I'm saying. Right, right. Yeah, I yeah, don't remember that. Was that, that yeah, I, and I understand that. And but that was a carryover conversation, and it was never there was never a, a mention about the other fields. It was only the field houses. Right. Councilman Moody, sir, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the turf fields. That was projected to be what, 6.8 million? Uh, for Norcom. For Norcom, the entire, the entire of the complex, I think, would so go down 6.7. For Norcom, Churchland was 4.8, and Manor was 4.6 to the entirety of all three complexes. So that, that did not, the soccer field lights uh, in Churchland. It was that totally was not, separate from the high school fields because and that it's was, not part of the high school. That was approximately $350,000. 350000 Okay. So as we said here, we're, we're not certain that 
what we're looking at here on, on the CFP presentation, that those projects are going to be paid for by ARPA. That was is, it, is, that, is that correct? I, I would say that decision is to be determined because that's going to be up to council to determine how you want to allocate those remaining funds that we're going to get uh, in July. Okay, well, if it's not ARPA, then what? It, then it would be bonds. And the amount of the, of how much? The bonds. 9.7? Potentially. If they're, if they're not funded through another source, then they would be bonds for the 9.7 or 9.8. Okay. It could be a combination. It could be a combination of ARPA funds or bond funds. So, so when, when's the deadline for a council deciding? It depends on how fast you want the projects to move forward. Because right now what you're doing is authorizing the funds to be spent. The next phase would be to determine what the funds are and when they're available. Because let's say we're talking about bond funds, we're having a, com uh, a conversation with our uh, financial advisors in June, and they're going to present to us when we, at the earliest, we can look for doing a bond. And so we won't know that information until they um, present that to us. And with ARPA funding, that can, that can go pretty darn quick. That can go pretty quick because we get that in July. You make right. a decision that you want to uh, use ARPA funds for these projects, then we can start working with the schools to start construction and create what, a schedule and all that. What's the, what's the downside on bond funding this? I don't, if this is a priority, I don't know that there is a, a downside. I'm not talking about priority. I'm talking about from a financial uh, perspective. Is there any downside side in going to the bond market? Well, I always, um, anytime we go to the bond market, you know, we, we have a pretty high debt as it is now. And so to the extent that we can reduce that or use something other than bonds, that, that will help our credit rating, which will in turn help the interest rate that we get, uh, which will in turn mean a lower debt payment. Right, so going to the bond market, that does not the best of options. It's one option. Uh, it's, not the, it's not the only option that we have at the moment because we do have uh, funds that we will receive that, could use, that we could use for this. Come July. Come July. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Dr. Whitaker, so you have the floor. Right, so actually what we authorized tonight can be adjusted correct so we can add on and take off which probably is going to happen once we see what ARPA infrastructure will fund correct well will more the infrastructure because the infrastructure will not be used for any of these projects but it could potentially be take used. from another project to put towards these correct okay so all right Vice Mayor Barnes, you have the floor, sir. So for, for the IC North on field improvements, the, the whole complex, does that include the, the um, softball field as well? Yes, sir. It's the, uh, the turf field, field house, um, expansion of the track, um, baseball, softball fields, fencing, uh, tennis courts, and the, uh, the interior sports, um, like um, the, the Olympic-style sports. Because right now, um, Nork I see Norcom softball team doesn't have a fence around their their field that they play at. So when the ball is hit, it just goes out into into the field with with no gate. So they're they're literally playing on a softball field with no gate in the outfield. Um, what is the the status on the the Cavalier Mountain project and the sports place? When you say status, I, re I remember. Um, I can't. I, I, I was looking in my notes for the PowerPoint, but on the, the renderings the, on the PowerPoint, it was saying um, 
I forget the term that you was, but basically we were we were saying that it wasn't it was something that we we needed, I guess, to authorize or something. And right. I can't remember what the what, exact what you're, PowerPoint. Yeah, what you're referring to. Um, we were tasked as staff to look at the possibilities for um, all of our facilities to see how we could enhance them to <coughs> potentially attract. Uh, more opportunities to, to have uh, events at those facilities. So what we did was did a rendering of both Cavalier Manor and the Sportsplex to demonstrate the what if, and that we, we have the potential, we own the property, and we can build it out um, to enhance those amenities. And we gave price tags on that uh, build out potentially based on the things um, that we listed in the PowerPoint. And, but that's all contingent on taking it out, getting community involvement if you want to go forward with that. But that's, I, I, I can't remember the, the prices, but it was one was like 60 million and another was 20 some million for Cavalier Manor, I believe. Yeah, Cavalier Manor was between 20 and 28 million. Okay. Um, Sportsplex, depending on which option or what additional amenities you wanted to include, was between 40 and 80 million. And, um, Regarding the, the sportsplex option, I know we also received some information regarding um, how Virginia Beach, um, yes. how they're doing financially. Could we, could we, could somebody speak to that in brief? Yes, we can speak to that. Um, good evening, Council. I don't have my notes in front of me, but just going off of what uh, we pulled together, uh, Virginia Beach, they used a uh, different sources to actually build those facilities. I think the one in Sportsplex was 68 million. The other one was in the range of 20, 10 to 20 million. That was back probably in 1999. But um, they used different resources. The community actually paid for some of that. Uh, it didn't all come from, um, they bond funded some but they did different they they did different things to pull in the resources f to build that facility now as far as um, revenue um, and how it's benefited the city um, I know we because I remember something that that was presented to say that they were using the, the revenue to pay back some of the bonds and things of that nature mm -hmm. well their revenue comes from different sources um, but there is not, it's not holistically paying off all of the debt that they incurred for that facility. Because right. you're talking about some ticket sales that they may have done. And it's just an extension of the actual down, what is it, downtown waterfront, waterfront. Because they had the oceanfront, then they extended it to that sports place because they were having different events there. So all of the dollars that they make is not all to pay off debt because they don't it doesn't make enough for that no, i know that so i'm saying what i'm saying is is that one the original question of why i asked for the the um the report in the first place is has it been uh, a benefit for them financially in the city i can't say it has because i i don't know i don't work for virginia beach but um what i could Whatever was in the notes, again, I don't have those in front of me. I we did. did provide all of that information with the income that they actually, the revenue that they incur. They talked about the debt. They talked about how long it did, how long it took to build the facility, what it was an extension of, how much it cost, um, and all of the resources. And it came, I remember, it came a lot from the hotel tax. Remember, Virginia Beach is a tourism destination spot. Uh, Portsmouth is not so much that. Um, so they were able to work with the hotels and uh, the businesses to incorporate different plans for resources to build and assist in building that facility. So Virginia Beach is a hard comparison because they are a different, com they're different in locality as far as a tourism destination. We are not that. Did we look at um, Harrisonburg as a as something that could um, could be a comparison? Because um, I know they have what about forty thousand less people than we do. Can you can you guys? But they're a college. You, you're hard to hear. Yeah, but it's not coming through. But there's there's a college 
that is a college destination. They have the students there. Um, but as it pertains to a, a sports place, that actually has really nothing much to do with being a college town. I say that because as somebody who actually runs an AAU program and actually um, travels around, we don't we don't particularly look at, or oh, is it a college city or is it a tourism city? We actually look at the event that's going to be there, um, who's who's um, who's having it. Um, so so in saying that, when it comes to, I talked to the person who actually um, his name's Chuck. He actually runs the, a few facilities around the country. And when it comes to those type of facilities, they were saying that there's more events than there is facilities. That may be so, but um, so that, and I'm not here to get in a debate about that information, but I do know you have to have a resource to be able to pull those dollars in. So if you're talking about a facility that is where, just like um, if I can say ODU had a facility they wanted to take Constant Center at that time. ODU would provide dollars and donations and whatever to build that facility. When you're looking at a college campus, they charge fees. Students pay for that. State may provide some additional resources, but that's how they are able to get their facilities. You got donations, you got state, because of the facility they, they run. They have basketball, which we know ODU is a big basketball team oriented sports facility for them. They also have football, but those dollars are generated through the uh, college in order to be able to build facilities of that magnitude. I think, in, I think in general, we might be talking about two different things because I think I'm talking more so about the billion dollar business of youth sports itself and um, just having something like that of attraction. And I think you're talking more so about other funding. things being the attract, yeah, funding and, and other things being on the trash. So, if, if I may, um, and we can definitely look at this Harrison mm. bird, I think the, the, the thing to um, remember here is that there are policy decisions that need to be made. A number of um, jurisdictions have facilities of these sorts, not just because of revenue potential, if you will, but it, it is the attraction, is people, and you, you have to weigh that against the cost benefit. Um, if, if the intent is to have people generate activity that bring people into the community to change perceptions, to, to uh, uh, fill up restaurants, what have you, then that needs to be a plan to do that. If it's to generate revenue, then we would need to really look at how we're going to, to get the facility um, constructed, and that could be a public-private partnership to do that. Uh, that doesn't necessarily have to be the city um, doing that. Um, because when you think about revenue, you have to think about the sources of revenue that you're going to get from those events. You have to think about hotel tax, which we have a few. Um, our hotel tax revenues is about a million bucks versus Virginia Beach, which is 43 million. Our hotel tax rate uh, is 8%, both are the same. Our restaurant meal tax revenues is $10 million versus uh, 89 million. So there is opportunity, but you can't look at it from the perspective of you build this facility and then you generate the revenue because the revenues are going to come in, in those categories that we have. And it's restaurants, it's hotels, and um, it's fees. Or it's, um, yeah, it's fees. And so when you look at that, you have to ask yourself, okay, is this going to be sufficient to track people to come to that facility? Is this something new? Is it not? You take the Bo Williams uh, facility in Hampton. It started out as a private venture. It continued to be a private venture till it wasn't profitable for the private owner anymore. So the city felt that with the expansion of hotels and the fact that uh, hotels were willing to help supplement that by paying additional fees because it generated activities at the hotels, then the city took it over. And it's not a revenue producer, but it fills other needs of the city. So it's a, it's a matter of setting those priorities and policy in terms of what you want to see out of these facilities, what can we afford to do, or who can we partner with to get it done. And there is a whole range of possibilities. 
Uh, Councilman Woodard and then Dr. Whitaker. So you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Yeah, and I just wanted to piggyback off that as well. Um, I, I think uh, when we say things like this isn't a tourist destination, um, it's a lot of history here in Portsmouth, and we are trying to um, make sure that we build upon that each and every day to, to, to showcase what Portsmouth is all about and to really bring people here. We, we, we can't be one-dimensional. It may not be about sports, but once again, it's a lot of history here, and, and, and that's a, a marquee for what people come to Portsmouth for. Um, but I do want to expound about what the city manager um, said, um, public I mean, private-public partnerships. Um, that's something that I discuss with her in private a lot. Um, and, and, and I think that could be something that we must continue to explore so we can get some of these projects um, you know, off our list. We're not, we can get some of these facilities in our communities. And um, it can help bring some of these families together, bring families to Portsmouth. So um, I just want to know what's the process or what's the steps that we're taking so we can't keep saying um, this is not a destination or people do not come here or we don't have certain facilities. What we have to do so we can go ahead and, and, and make those private public partnerships um, going forward. Basically look for um, potential private partners who would have uh, an interest in partnering with the city to develop some of these properties. So, so is that something you guys are doing? I, I mean, one thing about myself, you know, like I said, I worked in the construction industry for a long time. So, you know, I, and, I, and I, I worked in um, the, the entertainment field for a long time. So, you know, it's a lot of people that are interested in, in different business ventures. Now, now once again, we want to make sure they go through the proper procedures, um, go through the proper policies, whatnot. So is that something that council members do or is that something that they should be coming to you guys about? Because once again, like I say, we have the ideas of the things that we want in the city. Um, but I'm trying to say is it something that you guys should be marketing and getting those people to come here? Because I, I mean, we, we can't stay stagnant and, and not get these things going. You know, I, I mean, if we're not if we're not working towards this being a tourist destination, if we're not working towards this being a place where people want to come and spend dollars at and not make this a weekend stop, okay, then then pretty much we're not doing our jobs. So you know what we need to do collectively as a council, as a municipal government, what do we need to do to make sure that hey we let people know that we're open for business and and we want to get these facilities, these projects done in our city. Well, I think it's a collective effort. Uh, if you know people that are interested in a public-private partnership, then bring them to the table and we will have conversations. I mean, it's no different than someone initiated conversation with Mr. Dorian Finney Smith about a public-private partnership on the basketball courts. It starts just like that, that someone has an idea, someone wants to give back to the city, someone has an interest in putting something in a location, and once you find out that there's an interest, then you start the negotiation and figure out how can you get to win-win. Absolutely. Thank you. Dr. Whitaker, you have the floor, sir. Uh, yes, mine is um, dealing again specifically with the uh, capital improvement um, projects that were listed as unauthorized. Uh, I would like, if there's no objection from council, since since this is adjustable and we're going to be revisiting it, uh, if we would add the Churchland High School field improvements in their totality, the Manor High School field improvements in their totality to the uh, capital improvement plan, and at that time where we have examined uh, ARPA funds, infrastructure funds, bonds, at least they will be on the table uh, for consideration. And then also, since it's adjustable at that time, if, if we're able to address the school facility that once we have a handle on those funds, but definitely if we could put those up here in their totalities and then we'll adjust accordingly. Yep. I just wanted to say that um, keep in mind that we're limited to that $40 million. Right. right. So as long as we stay within that $40 million, right. I think we're okay. Right. Because even though we can change it, in effect, when you adopt the CIP, you are authorizing us to find 
funding for those items that are listed. Right. And if we're looking at debt, then we know we're limited by $40 million. Right. And okay. that $40 million could possibly be adjusted by, no, no, I'm saying it's not a definite we have to use all $40 million. Correct. It's just that's, that's, that's what the, the ceiling. CFO has told us in staying within our 10% rule. Correct. So, Correct. so what I'm saying is, if we are, I see, I see what you're if we're able to revisit this mm -hmm. thing and say we don't have to use as much bond funding as we thought, which would be ideal, yes, um, but at least we would have had these projects on the table to consider. Correct. And what I'm saying too is that at that time we will also, because we have a better handle on sources of funding, be able to look at these significant school projects, the um, church and elementary school replacement, the K-8 school, we can look at those issues, I think, with better information at that time. Gotcha. That's I what, understand. That's, mm -hmm. But in the meantime, I, I would like, if council doesn't object, to add the high school field improvements in their totalities. I think um, Mr. Wright, he said the church and was 4.8. I see North and we know that was 5.2, I think he told us last meeting. 6.7. 6.7. Okay, last meeting it was 5.2. So it's 6.7. That was Norcom. I'm sorry, I see Norcom. Norcom was 6.7. Right, right. Last meeting was 5.2. But so it's all 6.7. All right, and then Mana 4.6. Yeah. So if there's no objection from council, and then we would revisit it um, at the proper time. Thank you, sir. Madam City Manager. So, so just, that concludes the presentation. Right. So just to um, make sure there was no objection from council. Right. So in our um, motion, in the motion, uh, we need to, with the numbers for the capital improvement, uh, so we need to adjust that figure. Correct. Okay. All right. It's um, 62. So if, we, if we're done, we can go make those adjustments so we can have that ordinance. Thank you, ma'am. Also, um, we have now come to the item of, um, do you have any more report backs, ma'am? Okay, city council liaison reports. Are there any city council liaison reports at this time? Seeing none, that concludes our work session and this meeting is adjourned. We will reconvene at our regular council meeting at 7 o'clock p.m. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>